the topic today is housing, and we have an outstanding panel of experts to help us understand this complex topic impacting so many in our region. Um, I want to remind everyone that we will allow time at the end for questions and answers around 8.15 or so. So um, hopefully you grabbed a copy of the um, talk out front and that you grabbed a pen if you needed one. You maybe jot down some questions so you remember those good ones. Um, let me see here. So it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator in our Rose region, you. Um, I want to remind the mother of Asher, who is a 23-year-old young man with developmental disabilities, and Nora, who is a 17-year-old, typically developing daughter, who is a rising high school senior. In this. Last December, Rose teamed up with another mom to rent a house, hire a live-in coach and caregiver, and then find another roommate and establish a shared living situation. She feels blessed to have, such, have the arduous work and stars aligned to launch these young adults. One of Rose's proudest accomplishments is teaching Asher how to ride a two-wheeler. Not only does Asher love to ride bikes, his biggest passion is traveling and particular on public transit. Mm -hmm. Through Metro's bus training program, he has developed riding independence that his mom could never have dreamed in his youth. Rose commutes by bike to her full-time marketing position at the Committee for Children, which I had not checked, I didn't know much about Committee for Children, and I looked it up on the Google, and it was very interesting. <laughs> um, well, where she, so at the Committee for Children, where she has the opportunity to bring her gifts to this amazing nonprofit, the organization is best known for their innovative social-emotional learning programs that helps millions of children each year learn the skills they need to thrive in school and society. Help me welcome Rose Yu. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much. I'm um, so pleased to be here and to be among the panelists in terms of um, sharing some great resources for you all as you, um, wherever you are in your journey in terms of helping loved ones find and secure housing that will meet their needs. Um, so I have not been a part of this Facebook Live situation, so that's a new experience for me, so I'm excited about that. And um, at this time, I'd like for each of the panelists to just um, say their name and also their title and the organization that they represent. Me first. Uh, hi, I'm Robin Tatsuda. I'm the Director of Information and Family Support at the ARC of King County. I'm Catherine Festa. I am the Housing and Outreach Coordinator at King County Developmental Disabilities Division. I'm Scott Livengood. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at Alpha Supported Living Services. And my name is Tamara. I'm Homeless Prevention Case Manager with Open Doors for Multicultural Families. Terrific. Thank you so much and welcome to um, the Autism 200 series. Um, I think each of you have really great insights and wisdom to share with us here and in the Facebook audience. Um, and I think that the, as you gather information for your loved ones, that there are so many terminology and different things that you'll be tapping into that having the wisdom from a larger group is, is really useful. So we're hoping that um, as you go through the program, if you have questions like, um, was said earlier if you jot them down and we can cover them towards the end of the, uh, the program. One of the things that we want to emphasize today is both um, how hard it is to find housing for loved ones regardless of their circumstances, but we do want to highlight that in particular for loved ones that do not have um, support from the Developmental Disabilities Association um, administration that it's even, even harder. So we'll be highlighting uh, resources that are available whether or not your loved one has um, access to DDA services. All right, let's see. That's me. Okay, the first question. And panelists, you can go in whatever order um, makes good sense to you as you're called. And uh, let's see. So the first question we have is what housing options or models currently exist, and what should one consider when developing a housing plan? It's a big question with a lot of answers. <laughs> I don't know if someone wants to jump in first. Go for it. Me? Okay. It's me. I'll take Sorry. that one. Um, I will start by saying that if you're here today, I, I just came in, but there's a 
handout out of the sign-in table that says, which model is right for you? Um, and this identifies the primary models that people who are DDA eligible um, might consider. And I think the first thing when we're talking about autism is to realize that you know, with the spectrum of autism, some people are eligible for the Developmental Disabilities Administration, which comes with a set of services and supports, and many people are not eligible for it, and so the first question is always, is that a potential resource or not? So this particular list highlights the things that people who are DDA eligible could consider. Um, for folks who are not DDA eligible, unfortunately, it's a little bit less clear cut. Um, so how long should I talk for? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so if you want to just t talk a little bit more and then let some Somebody others else speak. jump in. And, yeah. and some of these folks can talk about other things. So in the DDA world, um, in, in Washington State, kind of the three primary ways that people access housing um, is through either what's called an adult family home, um, utilizing a shared living model, which is what um, Rosa's son is utilizing, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then um, if you have a DDA core waiver, uh, there's a service called supported living. And um, Scott, you could probably talk about that, right? So there are three distinctly different models with different types of care and different types of supports. Um, and this handout really lays them out. Um, uh, Catherine can also talk about uh, there's accessing certain resources like special Section 8 vouchers and, and certain things like that, uh, especially if you're DDA eligible. If you're not in the DDA um, eligibility criteria, then we're looking at basically what resources exist for the general community. Mm -hmm. So that's looking at things like uh, Section 8 vouchers or um, low-income housing resources, potentially home ownership. Um, or some sort of shared living type concept. It's just that there aren't explicit government funded mm -hmm. services um, to help people secure housing like there are if you're a DDA client. And then I have one more thing to say, <laughs> and I'll pass it on. Um, usually when we talk to people about housing, especially in the world of disability, it's not as straightforward as just the physical place that you live. That's one piece of it. Where are you gonna live? But there's other pieces such as what type of care do you need or what type of support do you need or coaching or something so that you can be successful um, and as independent as possible where you're living. Um, there's always the question of how's it gonna be paid for? And it's both how is, you know, how's your living gonna be paid for, your rent or your home ownership, but also how is your care or your support gonna be paid for? Um, and then there's often legal considerations. For example, one might utilize a special needs trust to own a home and then have somebody live there. And so there's a lot of different pieces that start to get pretty complex yeah, <laughs> um, when you're working through the housing process. So um, I'm just gonna throw out there that I brought a whole bunch of resources that are up there on that table. Um, one of them is a PowerPoint I didn't have time to staple, so be careful. Make sure you grab all the pieces, but it's got a housing picture on the front, because it starts to talk through all these different things to consider. Because it, it's um, a lot of people don't realize that it's actually a process of kind of fitting all the different pieces together mm -hmm. to really make it work. There's not like you're going to find one solution and it's all taken care of. So there really is different things that come together. Thank you, Robin. Um, just so for our Facebook audience that we will be downloading the, um, the PowerPoint and the other resources that panelists will be providing so that you'll have access to them. They're also well. all on the Arc of King County's website. Okay, so. sounds great, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Rose, and uh, I just remembered, when, once you said Asher, then I realized who you were and I remembered, yes. Uh -huh. Sorry about that, I meet a lot of parents, but I just wanted to say that King County is a great place to live right now because we have so many resources that are available to you out there. And one of them is a program that I manage is called the HASS program, and it's a Housing Access Services Program, and it's for persons with developmental disabilities and their Section 8 vouchers. They're single adult vouchers for the ages between 18 and 62. They're not family vouchers, but we can extend them so you can have a living caregiver by writing a reasonable accommodation, and I work with all three of these people and helping them write the reasonable accommodations. It's a, it's a great program. There are other agencies that are also 
working with HASP programs. So if you have a son or daughter that's not receiving services from DSHS DDA and they are receiving services from somebody else, you might be able to get a voucher from them. Another great program is, is if you're looking to buy a house, is the home site program. And I believe that Parkview Services is the only one around here that actually accepts the applications. And it's a 20% down payment assist for you to buy a home. And you have to stay in the home for something like 20, 25 years. Does anybody else know? OK. And um, otherwise, if you sell the house, then you have to give the money back. But. I recently had a young couple that I helped move in together, and they lost their voucher because they made too much money. It's, an, it's a great thing because you know they're paid well, and one of them works here at Seattle Children's, and her husband works at Safeway. And she said, I want help with my rent. It's, it just keeps on growing. And I said, why don't you go to Parkview and buy a home? So that's what she's doing. She's filling out the application, and her and her husband are going to try to buy a condo together. So there's so many great options out there, and, and you just have to be able to explore them all and figure out what is going to be the best for your child. And if they have need a living caregiver, you know, are you going to be able to find that? Right. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Catherine. And just as a add to that, I, I did look into that, and it, I think the challenging, it, it sort of depends on your loved one's um, capabilities, because with the, the home buying program, you do need to be able to establish your own credit. So your loved one would need to be able to do that. So for certain ones of us, our loved ones are not going to have that capacity to develop that credit rating. And for others where their um, financial earning power is a little stronger, they may have uh, more options. So I just want to say one more thing about that program, that uh, the adult doesn't have to be the person with developmental disabilities. It can be a child or an infant. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Um, anything else to add? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll speak a little bit about supported living because uh, Robin mentioned it. So in supported living, typically um, it's individuals who sort of rise to the highest level of care that's needed um, as part of the core waiver through DDA. And so we talk about housing, of course the house is involved, it's more of a support service. Um, and the majority, you know, our agency serves 154 people, 150 you get 24 seven care. So someone's there day and night supporting them. And even in supported living, there's all sorts of models that we have. Um, we serve people in apartments. It might be one or two people in an apartment. Still, there's staffing there. The majority are going to be three or four person homes in the community. They blend right in. They fit in a neighborhood. Um, and they're staffed there the entire time. Um, we access quite a few different resources. We work with a lot of other nonprofits to get state county city money to acquire the homes and when they get that money they have to enter into a 40-year commitment to keep those homes for people with development disabilities so it's very stable we currently have um, 20 homes that are through that program with other nonprofits um, we have a lot of section 8 housing as well we've got some subsidized housing we've entered into a memorandum with imagine housing to get some of their set aside units as well in the coming two years and then um, the fastest growing component of what we do is a lot of parents over the past 10 years have started to come to us with a home they own. And they then rent it back to their son or daughter and two or three other housemates. And we have 11 of those right now and we have two in the pipeline to be opened in the coming, one is in two months and another is in about a year. So that's a lot of parents are starting to do that because there is a, a housing crisis and there's a lack of affordable housing and this is one way to guarantee it. Just a quick question for you, Scott, then. So then do the parents, um, do they live in the house or they move out and find other housing for themselves? Yeah, this is not their own home. They purchased another home. Um, I they they either own it in their name or a few have actually come to us and formed an LLC on the side so that it's sort of a hands-off. I see. Um, but it is something that their son or daughter lives there and then other housemates. Got it. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, and last thing I want to add is that it's very important to consider timing. Mm -hmm. Many of these options, they require a lot of time to be considered, to be even like on wait list, such mm -hmm. a thing. So it's very good to plan way more ahead. Consider a few options because you will sort things out and it's apparently you may not qualify for some things, but you may qualify for others. So it's like basically the more option you consider and look closer, the better choices you have and the more time you give in order to 
apply and make sure you are prepared to wait. Mm. Again, that's that's a big problem. When we come into the point when it's urgent situation, you're just getting what you are able to get. So it's much harder than. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's great. So in terms of planning ahead and mm -hmm. also being patient, depending on the situation. Mm -hmm. um, Catherine, just a quick question for you then. For the Section 8 housing voucher, how long is the wait list these days for the HASP? Would you Cur say? Currently, it's a, a year to two years. Okay, mm -hmm. a year yeah. to two years. Great. We, we have quite a few people on there, but I, I really, I, I really like the uh, what um, what Scott was saying about the uh, the homes that you guys are buying. I didn't know that, so this that's really great. Mm -hmm. It is right. Mm -hmm. I I have one one story about a young man who didn't want to leave his family home, so the family moved out and left him the home and had three of his friends move in with them and it's very successful and they've had some people move in and move out but there are still four young men living there great mm -hmm. right yeah. so it's that level of uh, ingenuity that um, parents are needing to develop in order to meet their uh, son or daughter's needs yeah. mm -hmm. great all right then um, Pam Blanton with um, Partners for Housing whom um, the shared living situation that I'm in we are using her services and she wasn't able to be here with us in person, but she did have a five minute video that she recorded to share with, with you all. So um, here we go. Welcome. My name is Pam Blanton and I'm the founder of Partners for Housing. At Partners for Housing, our mission is to empower families to create housing solutions that meet the unique needs of their loved one with a disability. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about a housing model called Shared Living and the services that Partners for Housing offers to help you create the housing solution you envision. Shared Living is when people with disabilities live together to share housing and support services. It's a very family-driven model. Families find the roommates, they rent housing in neighborhoods of their choice, and they recruit, recruit caregivers to provide the support that meets the needs of their loved ones. The essence of this model is that compatible families commit to working together to identify and secure housing and services, and they collaborate to make the shared solution successful. Planning for housing is essential, and my advice is to start planning early. It's important to be sure your family member has all the services that they're entitled to. After spending more than 25 years working across multiple social service systems in King County, I know how hard services are for families to navigate. You have Social Security, DDA, HCS, CSO, Section 8, Public Housing, Medicaid. How do you even begin? And when you think about roommates for your son or daughter, you wonder, with whom? Who will be a compatible roommate? It is important for roommates to be compatible, and sometimes it's even more important for the parents to be compatible. At Partners for Housing, we offer a residential assessment to help you get started. We have an online roommate matching pool to help you find the right partners and we offer services to help you set up a shared living home. Our residential assessment is a valuable tool for anyone who is exploring housing for their loved one with a disability. It is designed to provide you with important questions to consider when planning for housing. Our online assessment includes a service review to ensure your family member has all the services they are entitled to a follow-up phone consultation to help you identify steps you can take now to prepare for future housing, assistance navigating services, a printable report for your records, and access to our roommate matching pool. We all know that best friends don't necessarily make the best roommates. Finding compatible roommates is a huge challenge. Compatible families who share vision and values is crucial for success. Our roommate matching pool is an online platform 
where you can search through pr profiles to find compatible roommates and the right partners to create a shared living home. Meet Chris and her mom, Teresa. Teresa is a single mom who works full time. Chris is nonverbal and needs support with every aspect of her life. Teresa's greatest fear was that something would happen to her and there would be no one to care for Chris. She wanted to set Chris up in her own place and not leave it to fate. She knew another family whose daughter had gone to school with Chris and the families decided to partner to create a shared living home for their daughters. They came to us for help with the process. We looked at the ladies' housing and support needs. We helped them develop household budgets. We helped them create a job description and compensation package for a living caregiver. We crafted a caregiver agreement. We facilitated the hiring of the caregiver through a home health care agency. We helped them with landlord negotiations and the Section 8 process. We set up notebooks that included their care plans, their DDA assessments, and other pertinent information. We helped them with every step along the way. The process took over a year, and it was all worth it. Chris and Addie are happy and have been living in their own apartment with their living caregiver since 2015. If this sounds like a lot of work, indeed it is and Partners for Housing is here to help. Walt Disney once said, all our dreams come true if we have the courage to pursue them. At Partners for Housing, we like to say, dream big. Check out our website for more information and feel free to contact me if you have any questions. We look forward to working with you to plan the housing solution you envision. Thank you. So in terms of resources, I know we've, we talked about how planning, it takes a long time and so forth, but what, can, what kind of resources are helpful for families in the audience as well as um, on our Facebook live feed that would help them get started with a plan? You again? Uh, I'll start jump in first. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say that Pam's been a great resource. Um, I've known her for like 15 years, I think, when she was former role um, working within the Housing Authority. Um, but in her role, there are times when people you know, go through her assessment and it's been established that they have a high level of need and perhaps supported living might be a better model or the family does not want to continue to have that involved of a role. So mm -hmm. she has brought me several people who were DEA eligible to develop housing for them within supported living or to move into one of the openings that we have in one of our homes. So a number have come through Pam, which has been great. You know, obviously, if you're a DDA client, to work with your case manager. Um, they're the ones that are there to refer you out to the pro appropriate program. And it's not as if you just get one referral that they assign you to an agency and that's who's going to serve you. You get your choice. Um, so you're referred out to a number of agencies. The family makes a decision on which agency they'd like to go with. But in turn, also, the agency says, yes, I would like to serve this person. We're able to meet their needs. So it's sort of a back and forth on that one. The things to consider, you know, you need to look at what's the right environment for the person. Um, some people can live greatly in, in an apartment. Others, due to maybe behaviors, noises, might not do well in an apartment setting, so it's better to be in a house. So that's something you go, and go back and forth with, with the agency that you're working with to see what's available as well. Um, so, you know, Katzen already touched upon some of the resources as far as King County is not affordable. I mean, it truly is not. And so you need to figure out how it's going to be affordable. If it's a subsidized housing, if it's a housing trust fund project, if there's Section 8 available. So some of those are some of the housing resources to tap into. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, I, I agree with that. The King County is not very reasonable right now when it comes to rents. But um, if you do have a Section 8 voucher and, and the rents go up, we're always able to write a reasonable accommodation and ask for increased payment standards. And there is still subsidized housing out there, and King County Development on Disabilities owns 46 units all over the Pacific Northwest, and I'm constantly advocating to housing 
agencies to give me more units and I'm I have some more on they're just down the road and um, if it wasn't for Pam I wouldn't be where I am today mm -hmm. she's the one who taught me what to do and and I, I just go out there and make those asks all the time what about people for what about development disabilities can we get some of those units and all they can say is no you know if, if they don't want to but I I'm surprised at how many times they say yes and 46 units it doesn't seem like a lot but when you have a mother who's living off of her child's social security because her child is total care, a subsidized apartment with a washer and dryer is everything to her. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, uh, well, I can add that in terms of people who are not qualified for developmental mm -hmm. disabilities administration, it's a challenge. And I think subsidized housing is probably income-based is something that to look closer, let's say, because with increasing cost, even if it's like some type of low, lower income with increase of median, you can expect that to grow. So that's something to definitely keep in mind that with increasing of uh, cost of life, it's gonna go up and up and up. So uh, maybe income based is something that you need to definitely consider. And that would be something that you know, organizations, mostly nonprofit probably, because you don't have a case manager with developmental disabilities administration if you are not a client of them. Then nonprofit like Arc of King County or our organizations, I, I'm sure there are some more who can help to navigate through the system. It may be very challenging. There are a lot of resources, but how to sort things through? What is open right now, for example, mm -hmm. right? Like what section eight is open right now? Well, you know, it's a challenge. So you have to check every single website, see what is available, what what's going on in the market right now. So um, if you feel like you're a little confused, I would definitely ask for help. Right. Now, yes, navigating those these systems are very, it's very mm -hmm. complicated. And the terminology is, I mean, I think even um, Pam was using a number of acronyms and was like, oh yeah, what, was that a, what does that mean again? And so, um, so feel free to, uh, to me, one of the great resources is asking other families who um, put together mm -hmm. something that might be of interest to you so that uh, it's, you know, you can tap into the wisdom of others who are like you. Mm -hmm. And the Arc of King County hosts... Um, I, can, a, yeah. I can tell you all kinds of stuff. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, I'll start by saying that this last March, um, the Arc and King County, um, DDD, and Community Homes partnered to co-host a conference, a housing conference. Um, and all of the materials that were shared at the, all the different workshops and, and the, you know, the resource packets that were handed out is online on the Arc of King County's resource guide. Um, so if you just go to arcofkingcounty.org, find our resource guide, click the housing tab, there's just tons and tons of materials there. Um, the ARC, Open Doors, uh, and Community Homes and Partners for Housing are kind of the primary um, disability organizations that kind of help families navigate these different systems. Um, and like I said, the, the, there's always that complexity of whether or not you're eligible for DDA or you're not. Um, and these different organizations understand what requires DDA mm -hmm. and what things yeah. you could access if you don't have DDA. So I'd very much recommend that you connect with one of these organizations. The ARC hosts workshops all of the time um, on all kinds of different topics, but we definitely have some things coming up this fall related to housing. Um, Community Homes does workshops throughout the county related to housing and kind of walking through that process. Um, so really, like I said before, it's a process. There's not a, a silver bullet. You're not going to find the one thing that's got it that helps you figure it all out. So it takes time, and it's okay. Um, but you know, start find a, someone you like, whether it's you know the ARC or whoever, um, and just kind of you know go step by step. Start putting the pieces together. And I agree uh, with Rose 100%. Often the best resource are, is other families. You know, talk to other families who have been there, who have come up with something, because it really, the systems are not very well developed. There are some things that exist, but a lot of the solutions that families are coming up with are these creative, outside of the box solutions, mm -hmm. um, and they made it they made it work for them. So these the families are going to be your very best resource. At the Arc, we have. Um, 
a, like a Yahoo email group list serve called Into Adulthood. Um, Rose is on, <laughs> um, where a lot of people share ideas and ask questions and kind of give each other tips on what they've done or, or ask how they can build something together. So I'd recommend trying to join that. We have a Facebook group as well, um, but the email group is the most active um, in terms of those kinds of things. Um, and then there are, if you're not eligible for DDA, there are like private pay organizations that are doing more and more around housing and independent living skills for the autism community. Places like Aspiring Youth, um, Enigma Autism Services. Um, uh, oh, I lost the name, it was in my head. Um, there are a few, I'm sorry that I can't remember, <laughs> that are really trying to dig more into the concepts around housing and independent living and helping folks develop like the independent living skills that they need. Um, we maintain lists of those are all the programs we know about at the ARC to help people understand those. Um, so yeah, it's kind of getting that conversation started early, um, knowing that it's gonna take some time and it's gonna take a, a certain amount of kind of exploring all your different options, feeling things out um, until you find what seems right for you. Great, thank you. And one of the things I found was that in terms of gathering information that it, you sort of get it from going to a workshop, going to uh, different events like this one, and you'll gather bits and pieces and then you'll be revisiting aspects of it because it's very hard to retain all the information in one fell swoop. Yeah. So that I idea that it's not a linear process, it's sort of, mm -hmm. it's more circuitous and being comfortable with that is really important. Yeah. So um, anyway, just a little pep talk on, on that front. Um, one, one of the things that I had, I think some families, including myself, had a misunderstanding on was around adult family homes. I, I thought, oh, well, when Asher becomes an adult, there will be these adult family homes available to him. And um, there are 20, I understand from, from Pam, 20 adult family homes in King County that serve uh, young adults with disability. Most of them serve the elderly. And um, so there are very few options for um, adult family homes for younger adults. And they're, because it's so expensive in King County, many of the adult family homes are moving further away from the city in order to be more affordable. So while that's, that is an option, it is um, a fairly limited option in my experience. Um, I did check one out and it was, it was not a good experience. So anyway, not to say there aren't good ones yeah. out there, but it's, uh, it's tight. And I think there's also that, there's a certain component of it has to be the right match for you as a, you know, as a person with a disability or for you as the family and not any one system is right for everyone. Mm -hmm. So like you said, you looked at an adult family home, but it wasn't a right match for your son. And that, that's reality. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why it's really important to really put your feelers out there and check out different things and trust your gut to what feels right and doesn't feel good. Right. Whereas I know some other families uh, with a daughter who found a really great adult family home in Bellevue and they're very happy. And one resource that we didn't list so far here is um, LEO, which is Life Enrichment Options, 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 Options. which is based out in Issaquah. It's a nonprofit and they own about five or six adult family homes, I believe, or, and then they're also buying, setting one up a little further out in North Bend, I believe, so something like that. Yeah. So it's an application process in that sense of they have their caregivers interview, when they do have slots available, interview um, potential roommates, and then the caregiver will select ones that um, she or he thinks will be a good fit for the rest of the residents. Okay, great. So one of the things that we've talked about so far is that it takes a while to put a plan in place. In your experience, how long, roughly, does it take a family to kind of put one together? It depends on what kind of a model they want, really. I mean, I've had, I've had well, a really simple one would be um, a, young, a young man and his brother moved out together, got a Section 8 voucher. They, they had a place to live already so it was just it was within months others have taken years especially if you have somebody who needs an accessible unit and, and they're in a wheelchair that's what takes the longest mm. even though King County Housing Authority has accessible units in their subsidized stock 
uh, there's they're still a waiting list. But mm. if you tell the housing authority, if you write on there that you need a wheelchair accessible unit, they will move you up. Mm. So uh, the units were were made accessible through the ERA funds. Mm. So okay, they want really to make sure they have the right mm -hmm. match. Mm -hmm. Right. Terrific. That's yeah. really good to know. I had another young man, um, his grandfather owned the apartment building. And if you have a Section 8 voucher, the rules are that you're not allowed to rent from a relative. But I can write a reasonable accommodation to try to get it approved, and they denied it, and I appealed it, and we won. And he wanted to live on his own, but his mom and dad didn't want to let go yet. They were, you know, they were like, no, 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 he's, he's only in his 20s, he's just not old enough. And he was adamant that he wanted to live on his own. So he got an apartment in his grandfather's building, and how he was able to get it okayed was to write the reasonable accommodation about his medical need because the, the person had uh, diabetes and had to have an insulin shot, and his grandfather would have to give it to him, and he'd be close enough. So now he's mm -hmm. living in the apartment, um, and his grandfather's on the bottom floor, and he's very, very happy. He wrote me a nice mm -hmm. note that I hung mm -hmm. on my wall for a long time mm -hmm. to remind me why I do this work. Mm -hmm. Nice. It's a great Thanks story. Yeah. I say, again, if it, if it goes fast, it's happening fast for one of two reasons. <laughs> one, you, you've got a great setup, like Catherine said, and it just is working. You've got the right time, right place. Other times, it may be because a crisis has happened mm. and something has to change. And if it's mm -hmm. that side of it, then often what you find, the, the, the solution that's put together is maybe not the best solution, um, but it's the one that was fastest to access. Um, and I don't think any one of us want our loved ones to end up in a less than ideal kind of situation. So we encourage people to start early, even if you don't know if your, your loved one's gonna move out yet, like, again, just start having those conversations, start looking around. You don't have to commit to anything yet, but definitely start thinking early. Um, like Tamara said, put your name on any wait list that exists mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because they do take a long time. So by the time you're maybe ready to make a change, your name will come to the top of the wait list, hopefully, and it will, the timing will work out. And we tell folks, think of it as a marathon, not a sprint, mm -hmm. right? Don't burn yourself out right off the bat. Yeah. Take your time, um, consider your options. And if you get to a place where it is a true crisis, where something has to change, maybe you're sick, maybe there's behavior escalations every day at home, maybe something's going on, um, definitely contact the organizations, you know, like the ARC or whoever, because um, we'll try to help you mm -hmm. figure out something yeah. faster. But it's, it's just, that's such a stressful time for everyone, and the last thing we want to do is stress out your loved one even more by having to make all these sudden changes. So mm -hmm. the more you can plan ahead of time, the better. So I won't even talk about the, the years of planning that goes into just qualifying for services up front. So you know, start early, get, get approved with DDA, but once, once you're sort of figuring out what it is that you want to do, what sort of model you're looking at, I would say start looking a year in advance. I mean, I've worked in this field now for 25 years, and in the good old days, it used to be someone was referred within three months they're moving in, we've got a place, we've got staffing, yeah. that's the way it used to work. Now, because looking for housing, trying to find the right match, trying to find staffing to get staffed up, it's a nine month process typically mm -hmm. when someone comes to our agency. So, you know, I would say once you make a decision on the model that you're looking at, think a year from now, my son or daughter will be moving in and use that time to truly investigate your options. I know people a lot of times feel in crisis and we get a lot of calls from people that they're in crisis and mm -hmm. they have a, a kid that they're having police involved with on a weekly, sometimes daily basis. I know it's stressful, but again, you don't want to pick the first option. You want to look around, ask to tour the homes go around and, and tour some of the homes and see what it's like so you get a sense of what it's like in some of the homes operated by these. Um, Alpha has been around for 45 years. We're not the only agency around though. There are 140 providers around the state in every corner of the state. There's supported living programs. Um, the nice thing about programs like ours is that it's a long-term commitment. Um, we, I think our average tenure with, with people that we serve is around 13 years. Mm -hmm. And we still serve two people today that we started serving back in 74, 44 yeah. years ago. Mm -hmm. 
So it is a lifetime mm -hmm. commitment. Um, we've done a lot of work with if someone is aging and developing mm -hmm. some, some dementia or something later in life, we've moved people into accessible housing, brought in hospice care, and people have passed away in their homes that they've lived in for decades. So mm -hmm. there is that mm -hmm. as well. So I would say a good year to consider your options. Well, I would definitely add to what Robin said, that emergency situation is not the best to deal with, and that's what most of my clients are. Mm. When we have to deal with emergency, fastest is not the best, mm -hmm. and for people who um, maybe have family members with developmental disability, have never applied for services, maybe we are, you applied and were denied before, maybe something has changed i would definitely recommend to reconsider and maybe applying again is a faster way to get services you want than trying to find without like without that support mm -hmm. and it, it may even take less time for example if we're talking about section eight right for any type of individual it could take let's say five years, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you can apply for developmental disability and if by chance you get approved, one, two years, right? So it's like, it take more time to prepare the steps, but it may be a better option. And in terms of developmental disabilities administration, like for example, they pass some uh, age range, you know, there is new assessment needs to be done. There might be some changes in the behavior. There might be some changes in terms of uh, what has been happened with this child, right? It should be before the age of 18, but um, there might be some situations where a child was not qualified and right now he or she is qualified. So that's reapplying or looking again at this option might be a good idea, that's for sure. And also definitely give yourself a time to make a right decision. Mm -hmm. So important, so important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And also as a parent, to breathe. <laughs> and I, I, I just, I, I kind of shy away from the idea of an ideal situation. You try to set up the, the best you can, but it may not be ideal in every possible way. So I know when we were setting up our roommates, we had one roommate that um, the mom and the son live in Lake City, and they had her parents live right in the area, and she really wanted to be up in, the, in that area. And so her, it's a very limited um, geography that she was looking into. So she prioritized that. And the other mom and I were prioritizing other things and we ended up moving out to Issaquah. So I think the more limitations you have, the more restrictions you have, the harder it is gonna be for you to potentially set up something. So having, knowing what your core priorities are, these are non-negotiable and the other pieces are negotiable is helpful just so that um, you know you're getting your main needs met and these other things may be you may be more flexible in yeah. Yeah, great thanks okay so in terms of the biggest hurdles that um, you've seen families face in trying to set up housing what are what are some of the ones that you've seen most often and um, I, I guess it doesn't ask the question how they how you they've addressed it so um, <laughs> we're all sitting back. Um, <laughs> you know, a, cu a couple of things. One is just the whole referral and eligibility process. Um, it is, and I think a couple of us have said it, there is not funding available for everyone in the state to be served. There's still a huge waiting list for people with no paid services. Last I heard it was somewhere around 15,000, 16,000 again. They, they did work to get it back down. So it is a crisis-driven situation. Um, it's needs-based, but it's also crisis-driven. So it's people waiting um, to hopefully get services. And you know, you mentioned adult family homes. One of the unfortunate things too that occasionally happens is that they will assess a person and sort of try the, not the lowest level, this worst, horrible term, but sort of they'll try something that's maybe not as intensive first. And we've had a lot of people who are referred to us because they've essentially blown out of an adult family home. Um, they have behaviors, they have other issues that go on, they might be assaultive, and they just can't live in an adult family home. So a lot of times someone has had to go through that waiver first before they're referred out to supported living, because again, supported living is considered people who are, quote unquote, an institutional level of care. 
if they're not served in support living, they would be in one of the state institutions. So that's a challenge for, for parents. We've already talked about a lot. I mean, as far as housing, the, the housing um, prices in King and Snohomish counties is a challenge. Um, so that's why we work so closely with the housing authorities to get Section 8 for almost everyone that we serve. So that's an issue. And then, you know, as far as any of these support areas, whether it's home care, supported living, you know, there is a staffing shortage. Um, and that's just a reality uh, in supported living. The turnover around the state has averaged 50% for two years running um, because you're talking about people who are not making a livable wage in the area. Mm -hmm. And so you do have a high turnover. And that's something that's hard for parents and families to get used to and is a real challenge. Um, I will sort of tout us a little bit that as a nonprofit, we're able to raise additional funds. We write grants, we do fundraising, we do all of those things that the ARC does as well, so we can supplement. So our turnover is around 20%, still high, but it's not the 50%. You're not seeing half of your staff disappear in a year. So th those are the issues that I'm seeing. It's, it's really important that caregivers are able to get vacations able to get medical and dental because yeah you're going to have that turnover so if you do have a living caregiver you just want to make sure that they're they're paid well and and treated well do you have one we do yes and yes yes and yes all those yes treat them well give them you know um time off during the week as well as um vacation time yeah there, there are, are there are people on on our caseloads that don't have to have a living caregiver and can live on their own and then there's others that live with a brother or sister or their mom and dad. But it is it, that's one of the hardest things to do is find a living caregiver that you can trust and that will stick around. Mm -hmm. True. And I think finding one and then also figuring out how to pay for everything. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an important piece of this planning um, consideration is wh where does the money come from? Mm -hmm. Depending on the type of model you choose, some of it's paid, you know, if you chose, for example, an adult family home, all of the care is paid for by the state and they move into a house that's covered um, through that adult family home model. They might pay a little bit of rent based on their income, but it's kind of all built in. Um, like Scott said, some supported living programs have houses that people build, move into, but others of them either rent or own their own house homes. So the financial piece is definitely something to consider. Um, depending on the, the depending on the model, some models allow families to supplement payment in one way or another, but other models, especially if they're Medicaid funded, don't allow families to supplement at all. Um, and so the, the financial piece definitely comes into play. And like I said, if you're not eligible for DDA, then at this point, pretty much everything is out of pocket payment. There's not state funds mm -hmm. to help pay for the care or the support. Um, and so that's definitely a big consideration. Mm -hmm. Well, I would like to bring another piece to conversation is language barriers and cultural mm -hmm. barriers that bring a lot of challenges um, for, for, for families. You know, you, you can be discriminated because yeah. you don't know your rights and uh, people are taking advantage of you just because you, you are not that familiar with the system mm -hmm. or you even don't know what you're eligible for or what your family is eligible for. So education piece is huge for this, you know, for these cases especially for the families so they would know what they're eligible for what would be considered a discrimination in their cases mm -hmm. what are their rights as a families what are their rights for their children or for their loved one adults you know in the housing situation which they are in right now so that it's it's a protection for themselves it's a protection for their children for their family and of course um one, this is very important, you know, to know what what you're signing for, right? What you're agreed upon, and what happened if you are not following through, and what what would be the consequences? So, uh, for example, uh, I work a lot of with landlords, and I've seen stuff that you you don't think it would happen in mm -hmm. our society, mm -hmm. and you get surprised, mm -hmm. and you just understand that's it's just taking advantage. So I would definitely recommend um, 
families and parents be very familiar what are their rights, what the rights of their children or of their adults of this uh, developmental disability or even any type of disability. Uh, what are reasonable accommodations mm -hmm. uh, and what are the legal organizations around here who can provide support, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. in cases when it's coming to more intense situations. Uh, there are a number of great organizations in the area who can provide free support, mm -hmm. legal clinics, who can provide some sort of um, assistance in terms of what you are eligible for or what is your rights in this situation and even follow a complaint or lawsuit. So, you know, in, in our case, uh, we do have parent support groups where parents can share their experience and how to overcome these difficulties. So definitely education is, is a, a crucial piece. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So, oh, I have one more thing to sure. say. Robin. It, I find that sometimes the biggest hurdle ends up being ourselves too. Mm. Kind of like you had said, Rose, you're never, you're never gonna find anything as perfect as your own family and your own home, right? Um, and so sometimes it's hard to imagine that something could be different. And so I've run into a lot of families who just, who are continuing to look for that perfection. Mm -hmm. um, and then that prohibits them from being able to make a choice about what options are available. And usually things end up way better than you could ever imagine them being. It's just different. Um, and so that's a really big one is to realize that it's, it's going to be different. It's never going to mirror exactly what it looks like at home. It's never going to mirror what the image exactly is in your head. But chances are, if you, if you take the time and really think through it, things will end up being really amazing and beautiful. Like you had said, um, your son does things now that you didn't even imagine that he was going to do. Um, and that's usually what we hear from people is that all of these great things have resulted in it, but it's just different. Mm -hmm. And so trying to just have some of that mm -hmm. realization for yourself as well is important. Right. And I, I think that um, in terms of hurdles, it's, I like to think of them as being, it's like one over, you know, you go over this one and then there's something else that's in front of you. And so even if you do have the voucher, we had the experience of the mom up in Lake City that um, we went to look at a duplex and the landlord was really friendly. And then we, we mentioned the idea of using a voucher. He said, you know what, I have so many people looking at this place, I really don't know. And so in the city of Seattle, I believe it's, um, you, you're not allowed to discriminate against um, people using housing vouchers. But am I going to mm -hmm. file charges or pursue it? I'm not going to yeah. bother, right? Mm -hmm. In other parts of King County, there are, um, I think there, not all of King County is covered by that law anyway. Um, so I think there is something about your ability to network okay. and befriend people yeah. who may have units that you might be interested in and so forth because there, I mean, not only is there discrimination against people who yes. have cultural and linguistic challenges, but there is definitely a discrimination against people using vouchers as well. Mm -hmm. there, there is a house bill out there right now where they're not allowed to discriminate. I don't know where it's sitting, but I, there was one. I thought, it, I thought it passed. I thought it did, too. I think it passed this yeah. last legislative session that, that in the state they're not legally able to discriminate, yeah. but there's a difference between what the law says and, and that reaction that and, you said. Right? And what they do is they, they push the rent up just beyond uh, what a, a Section 8 can pay for because Section 8 has got rent payment standards on what they will allow since it's a government-run uh, agency that says, funded through HUD, they, you know, they're not going to pay rent on a mansion. So they're not going to pay rent on something that they think is unreasonable. And so that's what they do is they just raise the rents to the point where they're unreasonable. Well, and also they, they take credit scores. Mm -hmm. So they can, you know, they're going to take people who have higher credit scores. And so for some of our loved ones, it's very hard to establish credit yeah. because of their limited work history or hours and so forth. So just, just so Keep it in mind, the marathon. Yeah. I was going to say, in the disability world, and you've probably already learned this through school and through all mm -hmm. these other things, right? Relationship is key. Is. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, if you know people who own or you can establish relationships with people, that's going to help a lot. It will. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So the last um, formal question we have, um, oops, wrong. Sorry, went too far. So in talking about um, laws and so forth, what are, what are things that we can do as individuals, as families, to help our um, 
political leaders and others to understand the, what limited choices we, fa we have and how much is, it's incumbent on families to create our own housing options and how we really need some additional support so that um, it's not just dependent on some families who have the fin financial means to create a situation that's really going to meet their chi child needs. Because one thing that I, I don't know for the people in the audience what it's like, but even when I looked at the adult family home model, I realized that having six uh, residents to one caregiver, that ratio really was not enough for my son. And so even if he did you know, go into one, I just thought his likelihood of success was going to be pretty low. So I feel like that we really do need to um, collectively advocate for additional options for our loved ones simply because right now the, the, what we have available is so, so limited. Mm -hmm. So what advice do you have for, for us? I have a whole bunch of stuff to say. I don't know if you guys want me to start. Yeah. So that's the arc of King County. One of the defining features of any arc that you come across across the country is advocacy related stuff. And um, for some context, we, I oversee information and family support. So we help people navigate systems. They call us and email us and meet with us. And housing has become the number one reason people contact us. Mm -hmm. um, I've been there for six years. And when I first started, housing was like number 10 to 15 on our list of most common topics. And now it's number one. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it is because we're seeing more and more people with disabilities or their families becoming homeless or um, at imminent risk of homelessness. Mm -hmm. But it's also because you know we're, we're realizing that the systems aren't in place for that future planning type of, of housing setup, you know, making sure that your loved one is living the life they want to live um, and not stuck with mom and dad for forever. Um, so not only do we do extensive work to help people navigate systems, but we've also entered into the housing advocacy world uh, because we know that people need it. And there's a few things that you could do, and I'm going to sort of tier them. So what you could do right now, out at the front at the sign-in table are these little yellow postcards um, that we've created that you can write a little note on the back. Um, and if you don't even like, so we'll send them to your legislators and your elected mm. officials for you. Um, if you don't know who they are, all you need to do is put your own name and address on there and we'll look it up for you and we'll mail it for you. Um, just write a note, even if it's, it could be as simple as make sure there's disability related housing. I think especially if you have a loved one who is not DDA eligible, you should write, make sure there's housing for non DDA eligible autistic individuals because Everyone thinks that DDA has gotten all DD stuff covered, which is not true. Um, so you can write these. We actually encourage people to write several. Um, and I've learned that the elected officials will measure how important the issue is by how tall the stack of cards oh. are. So <laughs> give them to your friends. There's a whole bunch of them out there. We'll, we'll mail them for you. Just fill them up and leave them there. Um, additionally, uh, the Arc of King County and the King County Developmental Disabilities Division, every year we host a legislative forum on mm -hmm. developmental disability issues. It's always the Monday right before Thanksgiving down at the Doubletree Hotel in South Center. I have a little save the date flyer here. Um, but we present different DD related issues to the elected officials in King County. We usually have almost every single district represented there and definitely housing is going to be a topic um, that's presented there and we need people to be there to show that this is a real real issue and often we ask folks to you know we select speakers to actually tell their stories and to help amplify the need so it encourage people to come to this if they're able bring your loved ones um, as well that makes a big impact um, during the legislative session um, the ARCs and the other disability organizations all convene in Olympia every Wednesday for what we call advocacy days um, to help promote the state legislature to consider the needs of our community. Housing is always up there as a topic that's discussed. Supported living is always a thing that's discussed. Um, making sure that there are adequate caregivers, that they're getting paid uh, appropriate amounts, that there's access to these resources. And um, people showing up really makes a huge difference. Hearing the personal stories really makes a huge difference. If you can't go to the legislature, um, you can always email or call them. I think a lot of people don't realize how easy it is. Out at the front, there's a, a little card with, a, with those QR codes where you can find out where, what your legislative district is and how to contact all your legislators. Um, so becoming involved in that, likewise, you know, a lot of um, 
organizations that provide housing go to their city councils, to their county councils, and talk about this need to make sure that low-income and affordable housing is available for our community. A lot of times people forget we exist until we're there banging on their doors, mm -hmm. right? Um, and another way that you can be involved, at least keyed in to what's going on, the ARC um, distributes frequently um, what we call like advocacy communications, either by email or on Facebook. So if you feel like getting on our email list, you can sign up here or you can like us on Facebook and you'll get frequent updates about the types of um, issues that we're working on or ways that you can share your experiences to help promote further development of resources. And I'm gonna say one more thing, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> and be done. So um, like I said, we're seeing more and more people who are homeless. And I think that's the last thing in the world that any of us want in this room is for ourselves or our loved ones to experience homelessness. Um, and interestingly, um, every year in, in King County, they do what's called a point in time count. People go out in the middle of the night and count all of the individuals who are on the street. Oh, did you count? <laughs> yeah, on the streets, living in their cars, or who are staying in shelters. And this last year, 53% of the total number of people counted have some form of disability. 53%. Mm. Wow. However, the services, the types of supports, the resources that go into homeless services do not factor in yeah. the presence of disability. Oh. So you have a disability, but the resources that are there to help you are not considering the ways that your disability is impacting your ability to be housed. And so how is it possible that they're helping ensure people get housed? Mm -hmm. So that's a big thing that we're also trying to work on is ensuring that these systems are identifying the fact that people with disabilities mm -hmm. exist, A, and B, that they can be homeless and that there needs to be very tailored supports to ensure that people with disabilities get those, those needs met. So anytime you have the opportunity to say that to anyone, <laughs> do it, yeah. Residential supports are really important for people with disabilities and they're really important for the chronic homelessness that we are experiencing out there right now for the mm -hmm. people who just, they don't know how to live in a house anymore. They don't know how to live within the community and those are the people that need a lot of help. I had one such woman and her two children and she was calling me 10 times a day. Mm. And I had reached out and I got uh, three apartments from a brand new building in downtown Bellevue. And I put her in that apartment and um, they had uh, a mental health provider on board, uh, I believe it was sound on the, in the basement. So there was constant uh, support for the, the families that moved there. And I haven't heard from her since. That's great. She's nice. happy. Nice. Perfect. Thank you. So sort of building upon the, the legislative aspect of it, um, Alpha and several members of our organization have been very involved in Olympia for years um, and have gone down. I think I have eight meetings with legislators over the next two weeks, so it's important to be seen. But the thing I will say is families are the best voice to speak with legislators. Mm -hmm. um, last year, I partnered with parents and parent coalitions to go down because when legislators see me, I'm a professional and they think that I'm advocating for something, I'm advocating for dollars, I'm advocating for something. And one parent that we'd been serving for a year, her son was extremely challenging, a very extremely challenging young man with autism. And she asked to go with me and the first question I asked is, when you tell the story of your son, can you cry? She's like, every time. <laughs> so we met with legislators and every time that woman cried and the legislators like perk up and they listen to the story, you know, they would hear the, ask that I have and the data that I would give, but that's the personal touch. That's the person who's impacted by their decisions, whether it's a budget decision, it's a bill they vote on. Parents are the best advocates of anyone. So if you're not connected to one of the parent coalitions, connect with them now. Uh, you can talk to Kathy Murahashi, Darla Helt. I can name all the ones across the state. I mean, they are strong advocates and they will teach you what to do. Um, it's intimidating to talk to legislators sometimes, but you know what? You're a constituent, they're elected to represent you. And they're making important decisions, not just around housing and funding for that, but upon support services. And are they going to expand that program or shrink it when the budget was cut back in 2009 and 10? So it's important that you have your voice heard. 
The other thing I'll throw in there is also talk to some of the funders about the need. And I'm not going to speak badly about one of the housing authorities around here, but I recently met with them and found out that because of the cost of everything, that they're not developing any more single-family housing for people with development disabilities. Mm -hmm. They're only doing apartments and large settings. That doesn't work for everyone. Mm -hmm. So it's important to tell them what needs to be funded. I realize what's more efficient with a dollar, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work for everyone. So I would be on just legislators talk to um, funders as well. Yeah. yeah, and the last thing is just bring more awareness in the community, saying that there is a need. Mm -hmm. um, as a community, be more sensitive to it because we like often, um, you know, think, oh yeah, it's important topic. We need to be um, aware. We need to have patience. But when it talks, uh, well, it could be your neighbor and could you be your friend living next to you and how reasonable can you be? How can you accommodate this person, right? As, and as the professionals, as the members of community, that's just a big thing for us to consider. We need to take care of this population. Right, thank you. I, I gotta add to that one because that's a really good one. Um, like I said to you, there isn't like a one single easy solution a lot of the people who aren't involved with the disability world assume that somebody else out there mm -hmm. is taking care mm -hmm. of it. And so they think like, oh, disability is not an issue, certainly not developmental disabilities. Isn't there a place? Isn't there a thing? Mm -hmm. Isn't there somebody mm -hmm. who's taking care of it for those folks? And, and there isn't. And so we need to really make sure that these other people, <laughs> everybody mm -hmm. is, is aware that there isn't such a solution and that we need to create one. Right. And so for, as a parent, I would say that in terms of how much time to invest, right? So there's one is creating your own situation. There's another in terms of trying to lobby so that we have some longer term solutions. Um, and then there's the networking with um, potential friends or friends of friends or church members or whoever who are landlords to help them be open to renting to um, those who might have a disability. So I think there's, there's for me anyway, the sense of how do I prioritize, you know, I have this much time outside of normal working hours to do other things. So, you know, maybe I will make one trip down to Olympia a year to, to try and do some lobbying, or maybe I'll do this or that. And, and then for me anyway, to say, okay, that's it. That's all I can do and, okay. and be okay and gentle with myself as well. So yeah. anyway, just both encouragement and also recognizing that we have busy lives too, um, especially our circumstances. Oh, one other thing, just a note, the SEIU, which unionized the caregivers, um, I've had mixed feelings about that whole thing, so, but one good thing about the union is that they do um, provide healthcare access for caregivers, so that's really a, a bonus for people who are um, accessing hours through that, through that venue. The other thing, though, in terms of advocacy work is I believe that the starting pay for caregivers is below Seattle's minimum wage. So my son lives in Issaquah, so technically the caregiver would be paid per hour less than what my son is making in the city of Seattle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in terms of turnover, it's like they could make more money flipping burgers in the city than, you know, working for us, which is hard. It's hard work. I will say that for living, and it, it, because housing prices are so expensive, that is a big bonus to have um, free room and board, right? When the um, when the standard pay is is so low. So That's why we'll get on my soapbox because you you yeah. said it. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. So, <laughs> oops. Oh, sorry. So, <laughs> we we generate position papers every session, and we're asking for for funding, obviously, to address the low wages in supported living and other in other settings. And um, because of something I saw every day driving to work, um, it was in my face every single day, we've changed our position paper to have something on it. Because on there, the side of the road, every time I drive into work, it says Chick-fil-A now hiring 15, 25 an hour, like making more than our starting wages for employees mm -hmm. who are taking mm -hmm. care of people's every need, mm -hmm. um, doing personal care, cooking meals, mm -hmm. transitions, transportation, medications, and it's every day work. and our employees see that too I mean yeah. there's you know and not to look down on Chick-fil-A or others but 
it's an easier type of job. You don't have the high stress, and that's sort of what our society values at this point, and they just don't truly value caregivers. So. I just like to start off by thanking all of you for, for being here, um, for what you do every day for so many people. Um, we're just kind of starting our journey, I guess. Um, we've got a young man who's 21 year old, just kind of aged out of the school system, mm -hmm. and um, we're not very organized. Um, and we're just, like I say, starting our adventure, um, trying to figure out what we're doing. He's pretty high functioning, so we're just looking for, you know, um, a bit of assistance somewhere. And um, I don't really have a question. I just want to say I, I appreciate what you've done, what you're doing, and um, you've given us some good starting points to start reaching out and, and try and just to navigate this, this maze. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Up the, up the street here on Standpoint Way is uh, Building 9 from the former um, Sandpoint uh, Naval, Naval Station oh, right. oh. being rebuilt into housing by um, uh, Mercy Housing. Mm -hmm. When I first read that was going to happen, they had put in for families when, and disability. So I called them up. I says, okay, you're going to get this thing done. How much, what are your gonna accommodations for the people with, uh, with disabilities? It's just, oh no, this is only for families. No, no single young men, period. Okay, I left that phone call in tears. Mm -hmm. um, but I understand, you know, that um, the same, with another at Mercer High Housing is going to do the uh, Roosevelt um, mm -hmm. uh, links, you know, rail station there. Mm -hmm. They're going to include in those apartments for single disabled people, mm -hmm. finally. But we'll need more of that. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, and then this is not a legislative thing, this is a city thing, where they've got all these, you know, well, it's King County land um, in the city of Seattle that needs to be built, and the city has not upzoned a lot of those areas mm -hmm. to right. create apartments mm -hmm. and for those, for, for housing, for housing people like that to do. So I guess I should reach out to the city of Seattle, if you live in the city of Seattle, to tell them that this needs to be done and to promote Northgate and other stations to you know, have housing and include, sometimes if you have an apartment built, I, don't, I know the ARC does not like the dorm model because it looks too institutionalized, but at least if you had apartments, you had available on, on you know, caregivers in the building or nearby because my son's pretty high functioning. He's a really good house sitter, but he needs things to do like, you know, his anxiety and whatnot. But that's the sort of levels that I need and I would like to see go forward. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. That reminded me that points of advocacy include a voting, hope everybody votes, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. and pay attention to what they're saying mm -hmm. around affordable housing, what they're saying around disability. Um, the parent coalitions that Scott mentioned, one, the King County Parent Coalition is housed at the Arc of King County, um, have a campaign that they just started that's called I Vote DD. Um, they have buttons, you know, once you have a button, you're official. Um, but the, we're, there's a very big push to make sure that um, families and, and individuals are aware of what people who are running for different elected positions, like where they, where they stand on disability issues to make sure that we can really vote and know. And then additionally, your point is so well taken that, it, that you have to advocate on all the levels, mm -hmm. city, yes. county, state, and even federal type stuff. And you know, Rose said, you've only got so much bandwidth, and that's totally understandable, we all do. Um, but whether it be just being able to vote or whether it be attending a public hearing or going to Olympia or whatever, like we just really encourage people to try to be there in some capacity mm -hmm. because that's what we need to really push that envelope. They do have these disability set aside units, but there's not enough of them. Mm -hmm. How do we build those up, right? How do we make sure they're accessible to individual adults as opposed to families? Like there's a lot of room for growth, but they don't know until they hear from us. So I don't want to leave what you were talking about, um, and Catherine's going to be able to speak to this a lot better than I do, but um, it's important that developers set aside units for people with developmental disabilities, and there's actually funding sources that are lucrative for them to say they have set aside units. So like I said towards the beginning, I think that our agency started talking to a developer in the last couple years, 
and we got a memorandum so that we got two units in their next project that's opening in Bellevue and then they're opening another one in Redmond and we got another two units and the idea is that every time they do one they can say we have a couple of set aside units for people with disabilities and it, it helps with some of their developments and it actually helps with their funding if they have that as well a lot of developers are trying to get you know uh, subsidized units disability units mental health units because they're able to draw in additional resources and funding and so two and two sounds small but they're one developer and so if everyone starts to do things like that yeah. it's better for them yeah. it creates a community of different people from different walks of life um, but it also helps our community as well. Scott's got me excited now. <laughs> I, I am always asking, when I go to any kind of housing consortium meeting, I'm always asking the developers when I meet them, when are you gonna give me some more units? And I had somebody reach out to me just um, three months ago and said he's gonna give me six units in Tequila. But the, he, they didn't make it to the funding round, so maybe it'll be the next funding round. One of the best ways to get development on disability units right now is through the HUD 811 tax credit in units, but they it's hard to track them. There's no place where you can go, mm -hmm. no website that says, here they are. Nobody knows. N nobody knows. So if I if I find out, if I'm like on the the if I'm there when the request for proposal comes in and I see that it's got something like that, then I I ask them right away is that something that you can send my way and i can fill those apartments for you and make sure that that person not only has developmental disabilities but also receives some case management and most of the time they'll say yes uh, okay i would like to distinguish with disability units are they accessible units because in my model my thing is the ch he does not need accessibility mm -hmm. but he needs a care you know caregiving Mm -hmm. uh, just for just a few hours a week, that's all. Yeah. You know, I need just like some on-site care well, to supervise. Well, that's the challenge, mm -hmm. is that generally speaking, the units that are identified as disability units are ADA accessible units. Right. Mm -hmm. And like most systems only see disability as whether or not it's ADA compliant. Yeah. So we do mm -hmm. need to push you know, policy makers and push developers to understand that disability is more than just that ADA piece. And then that's the separation between the physical building versus that care and support. So we also need to make sure that there's resources for that care and support um, that can tag along, either you know provided by the same place or that they can step in and, and provide that service where you're living because there isn't necessarily those two things um, yeah. available conjointly. Because he, he has medical needs, but mostly what he needs is to someone to make sure that he gets his medical appointments takes his meds, mm -hmm. you know, cleans up after himself, you know, mm -hmm. the, you know, doesn't leave a mess in the house and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. right. so, one, so one quick thing I wanted to share is that um, if you look on, the web, in, on a website, you'll see this um, uh, group, nonprofit group called Independent Apartment Communities. And we don't have any, we have one actually down in um, uh, near Portland in Vancouver, Washington, and there's a few in uh, California and different parts of the country. And that is more of a collective of independent apartment community, apartments in a building with um, a common social area, dining area, and um, somebody who's there to be of assistance, um, you know, 24 seven. So I think that it's unfortunate that the one they built down in Vancouver is so expensive I mean, it's you know, five thousand dollars a month, and they don't take Medicaid. So it's, I mean, you know, so they, I don't know how they're doing now. They're, it's a beautiful facility, and it's not affordable for most mm -hmm. of us. And so I think it's one of those things where can we develop a model that would work in King County that could still tap into Medicaid um, dollars and so forth, so that it's not such a huge burden on on families. Um, the other thing is that. You know, in terms of our networks, so the places of worship, other, our other networks. So I tried to network with a ch church that was right across the street from me, and you know they had a new pastor every year. And because I was saying, C couldn't we redevelop your property to meet your needs and also serve some people in the community mm -hmm. who who need additional support? But in the end, they you know they sold their their property, so it's going to be developed into 21 beautiful townhouses. And, uh, and it's not gonna be used for that certain purpose. But you know, they made enough money that they 
bought land in Kent and they're gonna do just fine. And so I, I don't wanna ding that church, but I think it's just a matter of, can we use our powers not only to network with politicians, but also with other uh, community members who have connections that they may be able to help think outside the box. I didn't belong to that church, so I can see how you know it's not a it wasn't a tight connection. But if you do have connections with um, other organizations that have land that potentially could be redeveloped in some way, you might want to consider tapping into them. Okay. So there are there are units that do have support to them, and and. Also, there are supported livings that are light touch supported livings, like what you're you're saying your son needs. And I, does Alpha do that? Do you have like? We have a few. I mean, agencies become known for sort of specializing in certain types of services. Ours has become known for serving people with autism, with significant um, behaviors and, and issues. So, 38% of the people we support have autism. There are ones who are more sort of drop-in care. I mean, we have a few where we just see the person a couple times a week, but that's few and far between. Um, I think I'm trying off the top of my head. Well, I think, think it's like, like so I know of a family where the daughter is fairly high functioning, and so she has an apartment. She does have a, a voucher that helps her pay for it, and then they use their Medicaid hours to, you know, they don't have a living caregiver, so the a person coming in to regularly check in on her, mm -hmm. but that's the way they support, or he, the father, supports her, mm -hmm. um, his daughter, in living more independently. Mm -hmm. There are several different models. Yeah. Not, so, that, not oh. that they're open. Do we have some questions from our Facebook? Can you hear me? Yes. All right. So um, I am asking a question from Nicole. She is tuning in from Nebraska. Oh, she wow. has wow. Um, a nephew and a niece who are here in Washington State. And so she is really excited to be hearing about this and learning about the resources to share with them. Um, so she is wondering, her question is, what types of accommodations are available to the older population, such as her nephew who can't live on his own? Um, and her nephew, little background, he is past age 25 um, and has autism as well as fragile X. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first thing to ask is, is he a client of the Developmental Disabilities Administration, um, which is our state agency that provides supports? And if he is or if he could be, then that's going to open up a variety of resources like supported living and those types of things. If he's not, then it's a whole different conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's the place to start, right there. Is, is he or could he be eligible for DDA? Very much. Was there another question, Stacy? Did you get your, yeah. Were there any others? Because I have um, Nicole yeah. said possibly. <laughs> <laughs> this is where I would say so contact the Arc of King County. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I tell if if you can hear me, Nicole. <laughs> either call us at two zero six eight two nine seven zero five three, or email us at ask a s k at arc of king county dot org. And arc is spelled with a c, not a k. Nicole can hear you. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't want to sort of go to the nth degree and, and figure that everyone has resources available, but there are attorneys also who specialize in disability services. Mm -hmm. And we've had some people who have come to us who have tried to go through services. We've actually helped them with the application process and getting the doctor's assessment and all of that. Mm -hmm and they might not qualify, and then they've worked with an attorney and somehow magically qualified mm -hmm. for services. So there are some attorneys, I would say, to partner with if yeah. that's necessary. Mm -hmm. And how do they find those attorneys? Uh, several of us have resources yeah. <laughs> of who, who we can refer we to. So have. contact the ARC. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or so. yeah. Other yeah. 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 Open doors. Yeah. Or open doors, all, yeah. Any one of us could probably yeah. help you with that. I think one of the challenges I find is that for those, um, it's great that there are set-asides for new buildings coming up. I think one of the challenges facing uh, many of the families I know are is that social component. So maybe you have the, the actual housing, but what about the ability to social, have a mm -hmm. social community to hang out with? Mm -hmm. And so um, that's where it's challenging. And again, parents are often trying to set that up, so it's just one more thing that we're doing because it may not be 
a part of where they're living. Mm -hmm. So it's just a lot of things to be to be juggling. Well, and that's what I had written down as other things to consider um, is that you're trying to build a life for somebody. It's not just about where you live. You know, I think any of us could probably attest, you've probably lived at some point somewhere where you're far away from your friends or far away from activities or far away from family or whatever that's inconvenient that you have to drive for hours in traffic or something, right? And so you, there's a combination of things to consider and, um, and nobody wants to be isolated. Nobody wants mm -hmm. to be alone. Is transportation easily accessible? Is there opportunity for activities? Is there opportunity for community? Mm -hmm. um, do they get to see friends? Are they living with friends? Like those are all pieces to think about too. Right. One thing I will make a plug for is um, if your loved ones have not gone through Metro bus training, I think mm -hmm. if you're if they're at all the possibility, their safe, safety issues are okay to to give it a try, because I think my, my son's ability to take, I, I never thought he could trans, I mean, transfer buses on his own, and now he's doing it, and it just gives him so many more opportunities to go places mm -hmm. on his own, um, rather than depending on somebody else to drive him, and access is a service that's here, and I've been a part of a panel in the past to try and improve services, so mm -hmm. the, Anyway, it's a long story, um, but it is an option for helping um, people to get places. Mm -hmm. So we have one more question. Oh, great. So um, Erica Lynn is tuning in from Montana. Hi. She is a mom of a son diagnosed with autism, and she is wondering where should I go to try and, re try and find resources and information available to my son and I? In Montana. If anyone in Montana. in Montana. Does the ARC have? I would just Google. I would Google the Ark of yeah. Montana okay. and see if you can find Great. something. If you can't, call the Ark of King County, and we'll see if we can help you figure out where to go. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I think we have one more minute or so. Are there any parting words of wisdom, pearls? Pearls. pearls. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, one thing I would say is you know, set a clear plan of what you're looking for, clear expectations of what you're looking for. But then also, you know, I've met with hundreds of parents when they're looking for services. And one thing I always say is be realistic. Um, you know, sometimes I've been given a list of, I want this perfect setting and this perfect housemate and staff that never leave. And I want organic meals and I want a vehicle <laughs> just for my daughter. It's like, Oh, that's a really sweet list. Um, <laughs> let's, let's come back to your non-negotiables. So come up with what's your non-negotiables mm -hmm. and sort of what's your dream setting of what you would like. And then you work with an agency, a provider, or it could be an individual who might be your home care attendant of what could work for you to try to figure out if we can meet your expectations or maybe even meet your ideal. So be clear. Uh, and I think that uh, brings us to 8.30 which is the conclusion of this talk. It was perfect. It was right at me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, I really want to give a big thank you to our panel, our moderator, as well as our panelists, mm -hmm. as it was fascinating information. I thought so. I yeah. thought it was really <laughs> And this is the new um, sensory sensitive way of applauding. Uh, so we will all do that. And uh, thank you very much. And hope, hopefully everybody gained a little bit of information. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.